This month, the world is remembering the life of Nelson Mandela. Under his leadership, the end of apartheid in 1994 led to dramatic social and political change in South Africa. Hello. Hi. To find out what these changes have meant for science, I met two young South African researchers who were schoolchildren when apartheid ended. Heinrich Badenhorst grew up in Pretoria and now works on renewable energies. And Jackson Marakalala comes from a small village and studies the link between HIV and tuberculosis. I'm interested in how science has changed in South Africa over the last few decades when your country has seen such change. Do you remember, either of you, the end of apartheid? We vividly remember. Um, I remember I was a little kid sitting in the um, lounge seeing Mandela being released. I think every South African was glued to the TV that day. True, I remember very well that I can picture my late brother who was listening to radio. I didn't know much, but I'd always heard of the name Mandela and release Mandela campaigns. And how did the end of apartheid change um, for you and the educational opportunities that were there for you? The first time I heard news that I was allowed to go to a mixed school in our local, uh, local town was when I was already at high school. And it was an opportunity, but still it was for those who could afford it. It was not a default that the fact that it's open to everyone, that everyone could afford. So there were still processes involved on how the inclusion itself would actually include everyone in that simple manner. Hein, how about you? Did um, the end of apartheid um, make a difference to the opportunities that were available for you? We obviously come from vastly different backgrounds and I grew up in the city and I went to the city schools and I remember when all this change took place I kind of I was left with a feeling of I don't really understand what the big deal is from my perspective there was never any animosity the big sort of sectioning of society happened before my time so we were already being raised in the, the sort of transition period where the, the the segregation wasn't as clear-cut. I think there were people were forced to start thinking about the implications of what they had done. And uh, so, yeah, from my perspective, very little changed, truly. Jackson, um, w was the change a much bigger deal for you and your community? It was such a shock culturally to some extent that I really had to try and adapt to this exciting change that I have. But with time, I found myself really being part of it. But whenever I do visit back home, I realize how much, how much of a change is still needed in that particular village and how much in terms of opportunity we still have to do on the ground to try and give each and every person such an opportunity. You know, if somebody comes to Johannesburg or Cape Town or Pretoria, you wouldn't see a difference between any other um, First Nation city, I think. We have the same adverts on TV, we buy the same products, it's a global community. But the second you go out of the cities, that's when you realize what's, where the problems are, where the reasons are that we're still a developing nation and we need to develop more. Now then, do you think the issue is not so much race, but of this widening gap between the rich and the poor? And is that now where the tension is in the country? Yeah, I definitely think that's true. I mean, if you look at what happened at Marikana, if you look at the, the service delivery strikes, the teacher strikes, all of this is not race-based race anymore. The economy needs to be able to support the needs of the people. And I think, yeah, that's where the big problems are coming from now. We we were talking about education, but often what happens is the most educated people then leave and go to America, go to Europe, to the best universities there, um, the so-called brain drain. Are you worried about that in South Africa? Well, what would worry me is uh, if... I, I think I'm happy with prospects of having South Africans going to to what is perceived to be the better world to study and learn new technologies and bring them home that's really great, but if they decide to stay there, it's a loss to the country to lose one person who has a master's or who has a degree or a PhD. And uh, I think it's what's worrying, but also we have other situations where 
South Africans can just be involved in a system where there's a research setup and they just work as technicians and they just help to get samples and so on and samples are sent abroad and people abroad do great research and really the credit in terms of research, you know, prosperity would go to people who are doing research outside. But I also think it's a new form of colonization of our own science. So to some extent, I also hope and dream for a situation where we can have good capacity to train our own people living at home, that gone are the days we would look at UK, US, wherever as the only solution where people should be sent. That I think we have skills, good skills, good resources, enough to, to take care of our own people living in terms of education. So do you feel a responsibility to apply your knowledge in South Africa to South African problems? Absolutely, I think it's a huge opportunity. Um, from my perspective in renewable energy I think we have some of the highest solar fluxes on the planet so it's really we're in the ideal environment to develop solutions that fit this and it will be exportable right if we can manage to do it correctly we can attract top scientists that's one positive very positive thing for um, the recently awarded Meerkat array so the square kilometer array that's you know one of the biggest radio telescopes in the world and we really need, I think, projects like that that are focused on perhaps not the astronomy that's a problem, but it's fundamental work. So, for example, renewable energy, where we can focus on our resources, develop something that we can then um, not only export to the world, but attract um, expats back and, you know, really create a center of excellence in Africa for, you know, I think South Africa is really in, in a big sense a leader in Africa so if we can show that it's possible and we can show that you know we can be successful at this uh, there's opportunities all over to do the same thing. Are politicians in South Africa supportive of science or do you find they're more of a hindrance than a help? Yeah I think <laughs> politicians will be politicians. Uh, as a scientist um, my uh, lecturer at university used to say that I can tell the egg is rotten, but I can't tell you what to do about it. So, yeah, I, I find it quite frustrating to see the amount of money that gets wasted and that gets spent on things that are really supposed to make a difference, like, for example, housing and how it gets perhaps, um, you know, funneled and redirected and you end up with a really poor quality product and that breaks down after a while. It's just, it's extremely frustrating to know that there is this available and then it somehow gets, I don't know, lost in the big system. What do you think your role is um, and your generation's role is in the future of South Africa? Um, well, our generation is the first one that's facing a global issue and so it's on everybody. In South Africa I think it's the same thing, it's no longer this, this community, that community, it's everybody needs to come together to make the difference. So I guess <laughs> the only thing as a scientist I can really do is try as much as I can to help students coming into the university to encourage them to integrate and work together and sort of get this common vision and common goal of you know where we want to be and where we should be going or how we should be getting there. Jackson, as a, as a researcher working on TB and HIV in the lab, how, how are you going to translate that into um, you know, changes in healthcare on the ground? I think first uh, it's, it's really not upon my shoulders alone. I really hope for a better cooperation from government providing platforms for me to be able to to share my findings and advice on how those could find a role in promoting a better primary health care system. So that actually would involve an integrative manner in which everyone on the ground is involved. So, so that's the best I hope for really, a good support from, from government, good support from people who are involved from all stakeholders really, non-governmental, policy makers, you know, fin fin funders and so on. Right now, everybody's reflecting on the life of Nelson Mandela and um, how South Africa has changed in the last few decades. How do you feel as you look back um, at that recent history and do you feel optimistic about the future? 
So I think the cleverest thing that I have to say about Nelson Mandela, perhaps with Desmond Tutu, who had a Truth and Reconciliation Commission, that had to do with first healing, healing the old wounds, you know, and making the point that we started a fresh uh, slate where everyone feels like I'm very much part of this country and I have to work for this. When he managed to defuse a situation which was potentially disastrous, I mean, it could have gone horribly wrong. I think he was an icon, as I say, and his legacy will live long, provided that following leaders would actually follow in his footsteps in terms of treating each and every member of the society as an equal. You know. I think South Africa is now at a turning point where it's no longer the politicians that need to make the difference, it's the people. So I think it's really positive that when I look at previous elections or the most recent elections, you see the younger generation start to think for themselves kind of, so start to think um, not along historical lines but start to think along the future and uh, what they want and how they want the country to be run. So I think it's extremely good that we don't end up having you know a majority that can just do whatever they want and there's no consequences. So in this sense I'm very positive in the sense that uh, it looks as though there's a shift in power and I think that's always good to have a balance uh, to make sure that the people in power aren't abusing it.